Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, John Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor. Pleased to be joined by Warren Moon, who we saw at the Hall of Fame. He was at the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, of course, uh, with Ken Easley uh, going in, which was, I think, such a pleasure. And let's kind of look back at that. Uh, Ken Easley, where did you kind of put him in the hierarchy of defensive players during his seven years? You know, John, I first played against Kenny when he was a freshman at UCLA, and I was a senior at uh, at the University of Washington. And I could see right away in his freshman year that he was going to be a, a absolutely great football player. He he just had a knack of being around the football. He was very very intense. Uh, he was very physical and uh, very confident for for a freshman football player. And I, and I think he went on to make uh, at least a freshman All American team, if not an All American team. And we all know about the rest of his career after that. So I saw early on that he was going to be a, a great football player. It's unfortunate his career was cut a little bit short because of uh, some of the illnesses that he had. Um, but other than that, when he was on the football field and, and when he was playing, there wasn't anybody better at that position. Probably he and Ronnie Lott were the two best safeties that I played against during my time. <laughs> I guess in the tough part about it, uh, you had to play them both in college because they were both in the Pac-10 at that time. And then, of course, they both came in the same year of the draft. Interesting story that he told me and others back at the, at the Hall of Fame was that uh, coming out of school, I mean, he was a quarterback in high school. Ran for a thousand yards, passed right. for a thousand yards, and Bo Schembechler wanted to have him go to Michigan as a quarterback, and Ken didn't want to have any part of it. He wanted to be a safety. He wanted to play defense. Well, I, he was he was born to be a safety. He, a guy that hit like that and it was as physical as he was, he needed to be on the defensive side of the ball. And I think the quarterback position probably helped him as a safety as far as the instincts that he had, the knowledge that he had of what offenses were trying to do to him. I think the quarterback play helped him uh, on the defensive side of the ball, but he was definitely a defensive player. No question. And the one thing I think is kind of interesting is that, uh, you know, now there's now a, a growing list of Seahawks that are getting into the Hall of Fame. Ken Easley now in. And, uh, you know, now we have uh, Walter Jones in. And coming up in the next couple of years, uh, at least I know we've talked about him for the last couple of years in the Hall of Fame. And he came pretty close last year. Kevin Mawai. And then this year, Steve Hutchinson is up. How valuable do you think those guys are? Do you think they, those two are Hall of Famers? Oh, I think no question they are. It's just a matter of when. You know, there's so many guys that are lined up uh, throughout the league that have been waiting for their opportunity to get uh, inducted. And uh, we've had so many great players over the years that you just can't put them all in every year. So uh, I think it's just a matter of time before some of those guys get uh, get voted in, Steve Hutchinson being another one of those. But uh, there's no question they are Hall of Fame worthy. Yeah, no, no doubt. I know then that's the thing that uh, I know as being a voter since 1988, that uh, each year we have a list of 15. And the way it's going now is we have to say no, at least that year to 10 with the idea is like, OK, let's see if we can get them in the next year. But this year coming up, it's going to be interesting because now you got Ray Lewis, you got Brian Erlacher, uh, Randy Moss is going to be up there. There's going to be a pretty good battle for some of those Hall of Fame spots. Yeah, there really is. You still have T.O. sitting out there. you got to wonder uh, what the voters are thinking about him. I think this is his, this is his third uh, go-around. Yep. Uh, and like you said, you know, Brian Erlacher and, and Ray Lewis, you put two linebackers in there at the same time on the first ballot. So there's going to be a lot of big decisions for the selectors, as it always is, because you have so many great players in this league. Define what it's like for you and others to go back to Canton each year for the Hall of Fame. It's one of the best weekends of the year for me um, because I was such a football fan growing up. It wasn't just that I was a football player. A lot of those guys I rooted for as young as a young kid, uh, I idolized. And now you get a chance to sit there and have lunch with them, have dinner with them, get a chance to meet their families. Uh, you, you learn a little bit more about the man as opposed to just the football player and knowing all of his stats and what he did on the field. And and then that makes you even more impressed with who this person is. When you sit there and really talk to them, you understand why they really are in the Hall of Fame. It's not all about their statistics. It's about who they are as a person. And uh, that comes out each and every time I get a chance to meet one of these guys and get, get a chance to know them a little bit better from the, from the time before. I couldn't uh, come over there on Friday because, I mean, of course, I was in Canton, but I was doing the show. But they have a luncheon every Friday with all the Hall of Famers. And I know I've been into it maybe two times, and it's special. 
because what happens is the emotions come out there of those that have come in from the past talking about the new ones coming in. Define what happens in that Friday luncheon. Yeah, it's called the Ray Nitschke Luncheon. It was named after Ray Nitschke, the great linebacker from the Green Bay Packers, and he was the guy that kind of moderated that luncheon every year. And, and after he passed away, Deacon Jones was the guy that kind of took over after that. And now that Deacon's passed away, Willie Lanier kind of heads it up. And I think Michael Irvin is going to kind of maybe take it over as well. But it's a time for, for Hall of Famers to uh, get up and just talk about what the game and what being a, a part of the Hall of Fame means to them. And we try and do it by, um, uh, by the last year's class because they're not allowed to say anything in that meeting. Like this year's class just had to sit there and, and, and listen and listen to these stories and listen to what these guys talk about. So then the next year, they'll, next year, Kurt Warner and all those guys will get a chance to talk about what their experience has been like over that first year. And then we go from the classes of maybe the 10-year the uh, reunions, the 20-year reunions, the 30-year reunions. Those guys will stand up and talk about, you know, what it's, what it's been like over that last decade. So, it is just a it's an inspiring experience to listen to these guys talk about what football meant to them, what the Hall of Fame means to them, and and uh, they try and, and get that message across to the younger guys who who have uh, been inducted over the last couple of years. And it, it's really all inspiring to know and, and, and listen to what these guys uh, talk about and, and what what the game of football has meant to them over the course of their lives. David Baker from the Hall of Fame, who runs the Hall of Fame, always says now when he talks to any new Hall of Famer, it's like, this decision is now going to change your life. When you went in as a first ballot, did it change your life? It really did, John. First of all, uh, there's a lot more respect uh, given to you that you have that HOF at the end of your, uh, your autograph now. When I sign my name now, that goes at the end of it. Uh, when I'm introduced anywhere now, I'm introduced as Hall of Famer uh, Warren Moon, not just Warren Moon. And and uh, it, it just brings a little bit more uh, dignity to your identity, and it um, it adds so much more respect to who you are, you know, because people know now that you're one of the best to ever play this game, and they know how many great players have played this game, and for you to be considered one of the best, uh, that just puts you on another pedestal away from everybody else. I know it was such fun uh, back in that meeting that uh, with myself and John McClain and several others pushing for you for you to get in so quickly. That was so earned and so great, and we're so happy that was able to happen. Yeah, I was um, you know I was a little uh, surprised myself, but uh, definitely uh, excited about it and uh, really appreciative of the the job that uh, John did as far as presenting me and maybe changing some minds of people who thought, okay, this guy is Hall of Fame worthy, but is he first ballot worthy? And and uh, I ended up being on the first ballot, and what what, a, what an honor that was because there's not many of those guys. Let's talk some current football right now. What are you seeing from Russell Wilson? Now, again, you had this at the end of your career, a high ankle sprain that lingered through the season. He added to it having a MCL sprain. He's taken a different approach as far as his training. What do you see from what how Russell Wilson ended the season last year to what you see on the field now? Well, I think uh, Russell just kind of reevaluated everything uh, in the offseason and said, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, to get myself in a little bit better, not so much not in better shape, but he was going to slim his body down a little bit more, play a little bit lighter, concentrate on different parts of his body. I think he wanted to be a little bit stronger this year coming in. I think he wanted to be a little bit faster and explosive. So those are the things that he really worked on in the off season. And you can tell by watching him in practice, he is a little bit more explosive. He's a little quicker than he was last year. And he came in the, the season last year in really good shape, but when he got hurt, it didn't allow him to keep his conditioning up as much as he wanted to. And, and he probably put on a little bit more weight as the season went along, which didn't uh, make him as quick and explosive and, and elusive as he wanted to be. So he's coming to this season that way. Hopefully he stays healthy because we, we've seen when Russell is explosive, uh, he's a very, very different football player, and he's a very hard guy to, to uh, corral once he's outside of the pocket. I see him in practice making a lot of – throws outside of the pocket that he wasn't able to make last year because of the knee and the ankle injury. So he's a different player, but a lot of it has to do with staying healthy. If he can stay healthy, 
I look at him to have a huge season this year. Like, how do you? Because I know that there's going to be an emphasis to run the football more. And last year they only had about 403 rushes, and of course his rushing numbers and even attempts were down naturally because of the injury. But uh, you know, with the fact that they do plan to run the ball more, I mean, do you see him maintaining that 4,200 yard passing yard number along with the fact that uh, they should be able to get more points? Yeah, I think he has a chance to do both: uh, run the ball for more yards this year. And then be able to throw the football for you know somewhere around four thousand over yards, only because if he's able to run the ball better, they're going to get more first downs, and more first downs means more possessions. The more you possess the football, the more you have a chance to uh, make more yardage, have more throws, uh, more rushing attempts, and all those things. Where last year, I think their uh, their possessions were cut down a lot. They did, they had a lot of three and outs, they had a lot of short drives, and this was a team that. Not only was one of the top rushing teams for many years, but they also led in time of possession and, and things like that. So they need to get back to that that category where they, they're leading in time of possession so they have the ball more and they can create more opportunities, more scoring opportunities, more production. How do you think that Daryl Bevel will handle it this year? Do you think that you know in the early parts of game, they just may tempt some runs, but not a lot of them? And obviously, if it's going to be in the third, fourth quarter and they're trailing, then you know Russell Wilson takes over trying to run and pass the ball. But do you think they'll be as uh, protective him running, or do you think they'll just kind of let him go free? I think they're going to just let him go free because he didn't really get hurt last year trying to run the football. Uh, he got hurt you know, sometimes scrambling trying to get outside the pocket in that. But uh, as far as the running part, I think they want that to be a bigger part of their offense. And uh, Russell was a big part of their offense when they were one of the top rushing teams because, you know, he put a lot of pressure on the defense, especially when they run the read option. People didn't know if he was going to keep it. They always, had to, they always had to defense that. Where last year when his injuries happened, people didn't, didn't, uh, he didn't have as much of a threat running the football, and people knew that, and they could gang up on, on the running game in general. So uh, him being a bigger threat in the offense is only going to make the, the running game that much better, and uh, I think they're going to they're gonna unleash everything they want to they unleash as far as the running game is concerned because that's, that's their bread and butter, and Pete wants to run the ball first, and everything else comes off of that with play action. I know he's coming off an ankle surgery. I know he's done well as far as meeting all his weight clauses. And so you're probably not necessarily seeing the true Eddie Lacy, but the Eddie Lacy you're seeing on the field right now, what do you like? First of all, I like the way he looks. You know, I, I think he's, uh, he's staying to his, uh, his weight uh, commitments. I think uh, if he stays light, that means he's going to be quicker because he's a guy, even though he's a big man at about 245 pounds, if, if he can play at that weight, he has very nimble feet for a big guy like that. And you have to have nimble feet as a running back, and you have to have that patience to go along with the power and the aggressiveness that he brings as well. So uh, that's what I like about him right now. He's making the cuts. Uh, he's, he's light enough that uh, he's, he's able to be patient, but but make the uh, the cuts and see the see the uh, the different areas where he needs to get to running the football. And as long as he continues to keep doing that, his timing will even get better and better with this offensive line the more time that he's with us. But I think he's really doing a great job of it. And then the read option side of it, that's something he's kind of really never done before. So that's something he's got to get used to as far as that mesh point with the quarterback, whether he's going to give you the ball or whether he's going to take it out. If they can get good at that, then he'll really be extra um, you'll be extra dangerous because not only can you line him up, you know, seven yards deep and run the football from, from the regular tailback spot, but he'll also be dangerous in the read option part of it if Russell and he can uh, develop that type of uh, – that type of mesh point that they need in order to be successful with the read option part of it. Well, it's not a given that he'll get the starting job, but there's no question that Thomas Rawls is maybe is working as hard as any player on this team to offer competition for that starting job. Well, one thing Thomas is going to give you, he's going to give you everything he's got, every play. And, and uh, I think Thomas, you know, he feels that he, he let an opportunity to get away last year because it, it could have been his job to keep if he would have stayed healthy. Because whenever Thomas has been healthy, he's played pretty well. But he had nagging injuries last year that, that kept him off the field a lot. I think that's one of the reasons why the Seahawks felt like they had to go out and get another running back in Eddie Lacy. But Thomas is going to compete for that job. We've seen that he can be a, a starting running back in this league by the way he played a couple of years ago. But he's got to stay healthy and on the field. And I think right now with C.J. Prosite, also Eddie Lacy and Thomas Rawls, 
they have a really good one, two, three punch of three different uh, styles of running back that will be very difficult for teams to prepare for. I know uh, I spent a good amount of time this week talking to Jimmy Graham, and he went into great detail of the struggle he had trying to come back from that patellar tendon injury, how hard he worked pretty much almost every day in the off season, and how it was a struggle just to go from week to week. And to come out of it as, with a Pro Bowl season like that, almost 1,000 yards receiving, it's a real testament to how good Jimmy Graham is. Well, a testament of how good he is and also how hard he worked to get himself back because you know, there's no question everybody knows he's a great player. Uh, he's a great athlete, you know, can play basketball and football, um, plays it at a high level. But when you have that type of injury, like you said, it's, it's really tough to come back from, especially in that first year. But he was able to do that and, and get back to a Pro Bowl level, and he's on a team that you know, really doesn't throw the football as much as some of the other teams around the league. So for him to be able to uh, amaze that type of productivity in this offense is more of a run-oriented offense. But that just shows the type of player that he is. Putting back on your quarterback hat, t- talk to us about what it's going to take for Jimmy Graham and Russell Wilson to be more productive in the red zone. In New Orleans, I mean, Jimmy Graham was one of the best in the red zone. Clearly some issues on the offensive line have affected things. But how do you envision and what has to happen for Jimmy Graham to maybe have a 10-touchdown season, particularly with the red zone? Well, I think it just comes down to trust, and it comes down to play calling. And, and you've got to... You've got to trust that uh, Jimmy's going to make those those plays for you as a quarterback, and sometimes even when he looks like he's covered, you've got to give him the football and give him an opt- opportunity to make a play on a guy. And then those plays have to be called by Daryl Bevel from the sideline. There's got to be a conscious effort to get him the ball when you're in the red zone. So those two things have to happen. And if those two things happen, you'll see him you know, score maybe four or five more touchdown passes this year. And then finally, I know it's hard to evaluate anything on the offensive line, particularly with the OTAs and the minicamp, because you really don't get to see any hitting. You've seen limited hitting so far, have not seen the first game. What do you see as where this offensive line is at the moment? I think they're much more confident uh, just because they're not coming out like last year at this time. They're still learning. They're still trying to get used to one another, playing next to the guy uh, next to them. They've gone through a year of that now, of, uh, of knowing the system. They've gone through a year of playing next to the guy, next to him, and, and having that communication because that's what it comes down to with offensive line play. You don't have to necessarily have five great players up there, but you have to have five guys that really are communicating with one another, five guys that understand what the other guy is doing at all times. And if you have that type of cohesion up front, you have a chance to have a solid offensive line. Some are going to be a little bit more talented than others, but at least you have a solid offensive line that's not making, you know, blown calls that are making, not letting guys run through free because of miscommunication. If you have that communication and that cohesion, you're going to be better. And I think this offensive line right now has has a lot better com- communication, a lot more cohesion, and I think they're going to be better coming out the starting gate than they were last year just because of that experience and that, that uh, one year that they've had under their belt of all playing together. Warren, it's great catching up with you as always on Schooled with a Professor. Looking forward to being with you all season. I'll be doing the opposing sidelines. You'll be doing the games. And, of course, it's going to be fun. Looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it as well, John. You're, you're a very knowledgeable guy at this game, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot that I'm going to learn from you this year working with you, and I look forward to it. Okay, Warren, thank you so much. All right, my man. Take care. And that does it for this week's podcast. In between episodes, you can follow me on Twitter at Clayton ESPN. If you enjoy these weekly one-on-one conversations, consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. Thanks for listening. See you next time on Schooled with a Professor.